and you're about to have you're about to have your encounter mixed with his encounter or her encounter and it's about to make total sense and i want to tell you this is a prophecy the prophecy i believe that the lord is going to begin to release collective encounters and looking holistically write this down collective encounters i want to tell you they're all throughout the bible when the lord gave me this word this morning he told me collective encounters and looking holistically at Look up collective encounters. Collective encounters, what's that mean? In a holistic manner. Collective encounters. When someone has an encounter, another person has an encounter, and they, I'm like, oh, collective encounters. Hey, everybody. Well, hey, love to see you guys today. Um that was Chris Vallotton, Senior Associate Leader at Bill Johnson's Bethel Church in Redding, California. He is founder, along with his wife Kathy, of the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry and is said to be, on the Bethel website anyway, a noted prophetic voice worldwide. Hello, Bezel T3. Chris is an author, an international speaker, as well as providing counsel to governmental and business leaders. Now, exactly what governments and businesses we are not told. Chris has owned nine automotive businesses in the past, which must account for Chris's fondness for flashy sports cars. Not that there's anything intrinsically wrong with flashy sports cars. I actually do like the red color. In fact, it seems to fit nicely with the flashy, polished appearance that Bethel Church promotes on their website. With the swaying and the praying, the flag waving and the dancing, the high-tech video production, and the onstage oil painting. Well, who wouldn't want to be part of this prestigious Pentecostal juggernaut? A juggernaut indeed. I mean, Bethel is huge and so is Bethel Music. And if those are the kinds of trappings that you think make for a solid Christian worship service, then you'll feel right at home at Bethel. Now, what follows is a message that Chris Volaton gave at the Bethel Prophetic Conference in February of 2022. It's called Encounters of the Third Heavenly Kind. Now, Chris begins telling the story of Saul becoming king in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Once you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 10, I want to just share encounters have great purpose. Now, if you look at 1 Samuel 10, you will find various encounters. We have Saul being anointed by the prophet Samuel. Saul then talks with two men about lost donkeys. He then meets with three men and receives two loaves of bread from them. Then he hangs out with a group of prophets, and then the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him in a powerful way, and then out of nowhere, Saul's uncle shows up. And that's just in the first 16 verses. I, I just, um, there's a few things that I want to show you in this, in this encounter. Because tonight we're talking about encounters that change you. Saul has this prophetic word that he's going to be king. There's only one problem. He's, he's got the right word, but he's the wrong guy. Okay, the upshot of Chris using 1 Samuel 10 is in verse 6. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now, one commentator suggests that Saul will be changed not into another man, like from Saul to Sam, but be changed in a way as to have new thoughts and emotions filled with new power in order to lead God's people. But Chris, now in the classic Narcissus style, makes this passage all about you. He points out that you, like Saul, can also walk in the prophetic, but you can't do it without encountering community. There are a lot of people carrying prophetic words that never come to pass because you haven't come into the community that changes you into the person you need to be so you can fulfill that word. There are people standing outside the church, angry with community, not realizing that it takes community to catalyze prophetic declarations. And like a two-part epoxy paint, the paint component will remain a wet, sticky, gooey mess without the catalyst. So too, 
your prophetic declarations will stay sticky and gooey and never fully harden to a shiny gloss without encountering community. Chris then goes on to tell a little of Saul's highs and lows, of him being insanely jealous of David, of his naked stints with the prophets, and his less than stellar track record as the first king of Israel. But sadly, he is pretty much done with King Saul, because Chris has other passages and bigger fish stories to fry in order to promote encounters of the third spiritual kind. We have, uh, Bill and I have been together 45 years, and we've seen so many people touched by the Lord. So many people. I can tell you that in Weaverville, in our youth group, we carried out kids in trances. It was common for us to carry them out to the car and for them to be in trances for six, eight, 10 hours in heaven. And I can tell you, half of those kids don't walk with God today. Now, did they just leave them in the car for hours on end? Now, even if that were true, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Because it's going, in, well, it's like going into trance-like states for hours, you know, hours and hours. Uh, well, if that replaces the awesome news of the forgiveness of sins found in Jesus, then it's no wonder that these individuals no longer walk with the Lord. Any kind of ecstatic experience, no matter how seemingly mystical or otherworldly, will get old after a, after a while. And then one day, <clears throat> it just seems kind of ho-hum and even kind of dumb. So people will simply move on to the next shiny object. Saul, having served his purpose, is now out. And Habakkuk is up to bat. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, let me read it to you. I'll stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart that I'll keep watch to see what he'll speak to me and how I'll reply when I'm reproved. Now, the main message of Habakkuk is his awareness of his own and his nation's sin and what God is going to do about it. In chapter 1, verse 3, the prophet asks, Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. Then in chapter 2, the prophet begins to get the answer. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that he, so that he, may, uh, may, he who runs may read it. For still the vision awaits the appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will, it will surely come. It will not delay. Now, when God reveals to the prophet that he will use Babylon to judge Judah, Habakkuk is absolutely amazed. But once again, Chris is going to make this passage all about you. I don't know about you, but when God says it's not for a long time, and then he says it won't delay, I'm like, it feels like a delay when it's not for a long time. <laughs> and I'd like to point out that there are encounters that you have that aren't for you. They're actually for a generation after you. Yeah. That you're having encounters today, and you're like, I don't, I don't know about you. Have you ever had an encounter? It was powerful, but it wasn't profound to you. And you're like, that was cool. People are like, that was amazing. And you're like, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, because I'm always having divine encounters. But some just, well, they don't seem to float my boat. But perhaps it's because my encounter was actually for people way in the future. You know, encounters of the third heavenly kind. <laughs> And not realizing that what happened to you is actually for the generation to come. And God deposited something in you that they're actually going to inherit. Yeah, yeah. Are you with me? Okay, the main thrust of this passage in Habakkuk is completely MIA. Chris's main focus is us having prophetic encounters. So unfortunately, he stops short of verse 4. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. This is a seminal verse quoted by Paul in his letters to the Romans and the Galatians. And we also find it in the letter to the Hebrews. But it's no big deal because Chris is teaching encounters of the third heavenly kind. <laughs> so, instead of finding Jesus Christ in 1 Samuel 10 and Habakkuk 2, 
Chris thinks it far more interesting to tell stories about himself. And not only stories, but big fish stories. I remember I've shared this many times when I was laying on the prayer chapel, that prayer chapel that comes in. We used to pray there in, in the mornings. Uh, a couple of mornings a week, and I was laying in the prayer chapel. Perhaps one of those six to eight hour trances you've talked about. Just praying, and it wasn't an extraordinary morning or anything, but suddenly I was taken a hundred years into the future. We're sending you back to the future. And you're like, how do you know you're a hundred years in the future? I have no idea. True spoken. Like, I actually had no idea. Like, I just knew I was a hundred years in the future. You know, it's truly astonishing that at least some people would not be heading for the door after a statement like that. But there they all are, seemingly riveted to their seats, hanging on to his every word. So Chris shares this vision where he is a hundred years in the future, and, and that's the 22nd century, by the way. He tells of being at a family reunion in a large, lavish mansion, and there's an old man in the grand room with a large fireplace, and he's telling stories of the days that have gone by and points to a picture above the fireplace mantle. And he's telling them stories about how they received all this wealth, all this honor, all this prosperity. And then as he finishes his talk, he looks at the fireplace and the mantle of the fireplace, and he points to it. And he says, this all began. And when I looked with him to the fireplace, there was this huge portrait of Kathy and I. Okay, spoken with a true sense of humility. So these are Chris's descendants a hundred years from now. And he and Kathy are the reason that these descendants are so wealthy and have this big mansion because Chris had encounters that were not for him, but for those who would come after him. Now, I've heard of some crazy self-aggrandizing stuff from the pulpits before, but this is on a whole nother level. And he said, this all began with your great, great, great grandmother and grandfather. Wow. And when he finished that, I was instantly back on the floor in the prayer house, obviously in a puddle. Oh, of course. And the Lord said to me, quit your ministry and build a legacy. From this day on, you shall live for a generation you will never see. <laughs> now, well, so much for the rapture happening this last Rosh Hashanah 2024. And also, it doesn't look like Chris listened to God because he's still in ministry at Bethel. So I'm not sure what that's all about. But I do know this, <laughs> that we're nowhere close, anywhere close to 1 Samuel 10 or Habakkuk 2, but instead are listening to Chris and his personal delusions of grandeur. Chris then rambles on about delaying gratification, which is a good thing, and then airdrops into Acts chapter 10 and the story of the conversion of Cornelius. Good boy, Chris. Never mind. Let's just move on. I'll do more and more, and then we'll do a little bit of ministry. Acts chapter 10. Why don't you turn in there? Now, I want you to notice that there is a connection between 1 Samuel 10, Habakkuk 2, and now Acts chapter 10. What is it? Well, they all have prophecies and visions that Chris can exploit. Acts chapter 10 begins with a God-fearer, meaning an unsaved person who is seeking God, named Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion. We are told that he was a devout man who gave generously to the people, uh, ostensibly the Jews, and prayed continually to God. Cornelius is then visited by an angel who says, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God, and then tells him to send for the Apostle Peter. Now, Chris likens this heavenly memorial of Cornelius praying and giving alms to uh, the 12 stones of remembrance that were set up in the Jordan River in Joshua 4. We continue. But what's crazy is, is that the angel says that in heaven, God is setting up memorial stones for acts of righteous people. And he says, hey, your giving and your prayers for the Jews, there's a monument in heaven. I don't know, does it say a monument to Cornelius? But I imagine, this is my imagination, God looks out one day and he goes, hey, that monument, have we ever done anything for Cornelius? No, Lord, he's still unsaved. Send an angel down there and get that fixed right away. 
All right, that is utterly unbiblical. I mean, are we to believe that non-Christians who do acts of charity and pray to an unknown God have monuments in heaven? I mean, keep in mind that good people, and in saying that, I mean in relation to other people, you know, quorum huminibus in the Latin, not in relation to God, quorum Deo. These quote-unquote good people will still end up in hell, and bad people, through the wonder and redemption of the gospel of Jesus and resulting justification, will end up in heaven. I refer you to Romans 4, verse 5, and to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly or the wicked, his faith is counted as righteousness. So the account continues, and Peter who also had a vision about eating things that were unclean, but now God told him that nothing is unclean, if God now says it's clean, is greeted by the men that Cornelius sent, and he returns with them to Cornelius' home. And he gets there, and he sees this whole room full of Gentiles. And Cornelius just tells him the dream. And he goes, now I know what the vision was about. Well, sort of. The fact that Peter went with the Gentile men that came to him, which went against everything he was ever taught, to meet with Cornelius indicates that he understood the vision that he was given. Peter then says to Cornelius and family, truly I understand that God shows no partiality and then proceeds to preach the gospel to a house full of Gentiles. And I want to point out that sometimes our encounters make no sense until we meet someone who's had a corresponding encounter. Or instead of focusing on encounters, Chris could have expanded on the preaching of Peter when he says, and we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Do you see how Peter appeals to the eyewitness testimony of those who saw Jesus both before and after his resurrection? It's funny that Peter says nothing about how cool it is he and Cornelius had corresponding encounters. And yet, Chris will use this account in Acts to postulate and even prophesy that your personal Cornelius is coming to aid in your personal encounter. But metaphorically speaking, Cornelius is coming. Listen, I'm prophesying this though. Cornelius is coming And what you think is a ridiculous dream, you're perplexed about it because you know it's something to do with the divine. You don't know what it is. Cornelius is about to knock on your gate. And you're about to have, you're about to have your encounter mixed with his encounter or her encounter. And it's about to make total sense. And what do you get when your divine encounter is blended up with someone else's encounter? Well, let's say it all together. Collective Encounters, collective encounters, collective encounters, collective encounters, collective encounters, collective encounters, oh, collective encounters. Because remember, this message is called Encounters of the Third Heavenly Kind. Now, Chris will talk about, predictably, the story of Joseph in Genesis 37. And why? Because the dreams and the visions in the story. How many people are dead? Because we don't understand collective encounters. That our encounter isn't just for me. It's not all about me. God's like, I'm going to be a great leader. God makes you a great leader. It ain't for you. I'm just trying to say, listen, just figure this out. It's not all about you. You know, if Chris truly believed that, then why would he make the Bible all about them? Now, here comes the conclusion of the message. I hope you're ready. And all I'm getting at is this, is that God is giving us encounters. I'm telling you, encounters are going to be, this is going to be the buzzword for the next three years. Have you had an encounter? People aren't going to say, did you get a word? You're going to have words, but the buzzword is going to be encounters. Have you had an encounter? 
So that was back in 2022 uh, when this message was given, and that makes it about three and a half years fr uh, from since now. And I'm not sure that Encounters, um, other than at Bethel, has reached the level of an evangelical buzzword. It's in the collective synergy that comes from the other parts of the body that actually create the nitro, I think Bill said something funny, the nitro and glycerin. Like it takes, it takes two, they say. Okay, aside from the fact that there is no nitro in nitroglycerin, it's actually a mixture of glycerol and certain acids that make up the explosive liquid. Anyway, we are so far from anything resembling a true Christian message that you might as well be in a Christian science reading room with a lit M80 in your hand. And I believe that we're going to be talking about collective encounters. 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 Oh, collective encounters. More and more. And people are going to... The, the, I'll say... That some of the greatest testimonies we're going to hear in the next three years are Johnny had a dream and Henry had a trance and something happened, they got together and something crazy happened that they could never do by themselves. So when Johnny has a dream and Henry has a trance, you put them together, you blend it all up and you get spiritual nitroglycerin. And boom goes the dynamite. And people who don't even know God, the ferals, the Corneliuses, people that wouldn't be included in the university in Bethel's campus, they're going to have encounters. Yeah, that's right. The kings of the earth are going to have encounters. And God's raising up the Josephs, the Esthers. They're going to be there at the exact right time. Only at Bethel and other hyper-Pentecostal churches like it can get the gospel forest uh, missed for the trees of dreams and visions and collective encounters where your Cornelius is out there waiting to blend his divine Matterhorn white epoxy paint with your divine chemical catalyst to harden up what will be a, well, a shiny super collective encounter. You may even see your future as you lay on the floor of the prayer room in a trance for hours. Only at Bethel and other hyper-Pentecostal churches like it can you bring in your divine glycerol and mix it with even a non-Christian's spirit-inspired sulfuric acid and blow things up into a supernatural, um, well, big, big explosion. I'll do more and more and then we'll do a little bit of ministry. See, just one more anecdote from God's Word to bolster Chris's unbiblical message. Since Saul prophesied and Habakkuk prophesied and Joseph had a dream and Cornelius had a vision, well, you can too. And even the pagan down the street can. Chris just basically said, okay, we'll do one more biblical anecdote and then we'll get on to the real stuff, the ministry. In other words, God's word is simply the template one must follow so that real ministry can begin. And of course, the real ministry is signs and wonders, miraculous healings, words of knowledge, and now collective encounters. Friends, this is not Christianity. Bethel's obsession with supernatural power and influence has eclipsed their love and devotion to Christ Jesus and his gospel. Personal subjective experience, like traveling a hundred years in the future, for instance, has replaced the historic eyewitness accounts and testimony of those who actually saw Jesus live, die, and rise again and ascend to heaven 40 days later. Folks, the people at Bethel, they're passionate, but they are impoverished as to the biblical basics that are able to anchor one's faith securely in the harbor of God's truth, love, and grace when the worst happens. Cornelius did have an encounter with an angel, and Peter did have an invite, a, a divine vision, and God did bring them together. But the outcome of that encounter was not more ecstatic, mystical experiences, but rather the preaching of the Word of God and spirit-wrought conversion to Christianity 
of some of the very first Gentiles as the gospel began to spread throughout the whole world.